Welcome all tonight. We, we are fortunate to have with us Rabbi Shlomo Farhi. Um, he doesn't make it uh, too often down to Miami. He messaged me this week. He told me he has an affair. Right away we grabbed him the first time to get a shiur and Baruch Hashem from the turnout. I could see that a lot of people also were excited to see him. Uh, I want to first thank uh, the president, Sharon Hakman and uh, Rabbi Yair Masri who opened up the shul tonight. He happens to be here. He's, he's at a wedding tonight. He couldn't make it. He's going to try to make it at the end. Uh, and Bezat Hashem, tonight we're going to be talking about chinuch, uh, chinuch banim. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went on a project to start a high school, or Hatara High School, which Baruch Hashem has uh, been very successful. So chinuch banim is a very important subject. Uh, and seeing from tonight's audience, it seems like a lot of people have the same feelings. So without further ado, Rabbi Shlomo Farkin. Give me the tutorial on the microphones, though. Am I just using this one? Putting it over here or leaving it on the thing? Yeah. Whatever you say. Yeah. You're in charge. <clears throat> one of the things um, that I always, uh, I always laugh about is that, you know, if you don't take the initiative, uh, a lot of times you wind up having to live with the choices that were made. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. They asked me once when I was giving a speech in London, in one of the universities, how would you like to be introduced? I said, I don't know, whatever. You know, I'm not all that bothered, whatever you want to introduce me as. Anyway, the guy gets up in front of everyone. I had this whole speech prepared, very serious, very, you know, moving. You know, it's going to be, I'm going to hit them in the emotions. I'm going to get, go for all the feels, like, you know. And he stands up and he says, and now, the hilarious Rabbi Farhi. And I, I, was, I was set up for failure, you know. And it's my own fault. Because when he asked me how I wanted to be introduced, I left it to him. So I kind of feel a little bit about that, feeling like that tonight. Uh, uh, Jonathan, when, when we were speaking on the phone, uh, he said, what should the title of the shiur be? I said, I don't know, it'll be something about Chinuch. Uh, you know, call me afterwards, we'll, we'll come up with a title. Anyway, next thing I know, there's a flyer, and it says, Mastering the Art of Chinuch. <laughs> I'm like, is this a 40-part series? <laughs> or am I speaking for 45 minutes or an hour? I'm, mastering the Art of Chinuch? I feel like I've already let you down. <laughs> if you thought that you were going to learn this uh, just by coming out here tonight. That's number one. Number two... Um, I, I could pretend that I've mastered the art of chinuch. You know, I can make believe, but I have my consuegro and my son-in-law here, so they know I'd be faking it if I kind of pretended like I've mastered the art. They know, they know me intimately well. My wife is here too, but she maybe would play along with me pretending like we got it right because it looks bad on both of us. But um, I can assure you one thing before we begin the class tonight. You will not master the art of chinuch <laughs> this evening. However, maybe there is something that we could share which would allow us to master the art of chinuch in one night. Um, I also want to wish a tremendous mazal tov to my, uh, my in-laws who are making a wedding tomorrow night. Baruch. And look at them here, and my son-in-law here, listening to the class of the night before the wedding. That is misirut nefesh, to have good relations... <laughs> Good relationships with your with your in-laws. <laughs> Number two, I also want to say Hazaku uh, Baruch and a big mazal tov. Last night was my 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, I was zocher to be able to make it to one of the first finish lines. Hopefully, 
will continue making it to more finish lines. My favorite thing in the world in teaching Torah is to do something that happened when I was in my father's shul one summer. There's a little grandma, maybe four foot tall. She's standing there on both like this, reaching, and she can't. She's trying to get a chumash off the shelf. Standing right there. I said, uh, Safta, relax. You know, she can give herself a hernia. I don't know what's going to go, you know, relax, take it easy. I reach up, I grab this, the chumash. I give it to her, she says, thank you. As she says, thank you, she catches a glimpse under my talit that I was the rabbi. She felt so bad. I'm so sorry, rabbi. I can't believe I, I, was, I, you, I made you get the chumash for me. I never would have asked. I would, I would have waited. She can't apologize enough. And I said to her, Safta, relax. A rabbi's job is to take the Torah from a place when it's, where it's inaccessible and to bring it to where everyone can reach it. This is my whole life, in a nutshell, is that moment. My favorite thing in teaching Torah is taking something which is out of reach, which seems to be in another place, it's not accessible, it doesn't seem relevant or important or, uh, or present or current, and to show you by peeling off one of the layers or by opening up one of the panim, one, just one of the maybe 70 faces that it has, you'll see that the Torah is so present and so real. And when our Chachamim gave us words of interpretation, those words of interpretation are, they are like lightning in a bottle. So I decided that we're going to give our whole shiur based on the opening of this week's parasha. I thought if it wasn't hard enough, to teach mastering the art of Chinuch, how about I limited myself to just the opening of our parasha? So with that introduction, and you knowing that likely, in all likelihood that I'll fail tonight, and you'll fail tonight, let's begin. God spoke to Moshe and he said, Speak to Aaron and tell him, When you raise up the candles, the lights, They should be lit facing the menorah. All of the seven candles should face the menorah, should light up the menorah. I'm not interpreting anything yet. Aaron did what he was told to do. He raised up the candles, the lights. Exactly like Hashem had commanded Moshe. And this was Ma'aseh Menorah. This was the creation of this Menorah that Aharon was lighting. It was banged out of gold. It was banged out. It banged all, hammered out of a, a block of gold. Like God had commanded Moshe, can asat the menorah. So did he make the menorah. How many pesukim we got there? Four, and one of them is vayidaber amunai Moshe lemor. That's a gimme. So three pesukim. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that hidden in these three pesukim, and in the words of our Pashtan, in the words of our commentator, Rashi Kadosh, my friends, we will find kernels, nuggets, elements of beauty, elements of wisdom in Chinuch that really encompass, I believe, uh, an enormous part of the challenge of what Chinuch means. But first, before we begin, I want to give you a tiny introduction. And this introduction to what Chinuch is, is found in the word itself, Chinuch. Chinuch is often translated, lechanech means to teach. That's what we call, when we talk about chinuch, chinuch means teaching. So educating children, what is it all about? It's about teaching them. However, when you have a new house, what do you throw? Chanukat abayit. When they had a mizbeach, what did they call it? Chanukat mizbeach. What does that mean? They were teaching the mizbeach. They were teaching the home. That's what... Chinuch or Chanukah over there means the holiday of Chanukah. 
that word actually means something else. It means to inaugurate, to start something off. And I believe that it is in the limitation of the first explanation of Chinuch, where most of us and our challenges in Chinuch can be found. But if we were to expand the definition of Chinuch, not just to mean to teach, but to begin, to inaugurate, to give a head start, then a lot of what we learn tonight will hopefully light our path and perhaps uh, give us opportunities to learn. I'd like to suggest, and the reason why I did this was because I know that I've been to many classes and I can't remember them. Anyone else have this problem? Yes? Yes, yes. this problem. So what are you going to do? You're going to take notes the whole time, then you can't pay attention. You see people sitting there on their phone, right, the whole time. They're either ADHD or they're taking notes like a maniac. Like, you know, it's, I don't know, I never know which is which. But my friends, if you took notes like that, you weren't paying attention. You weren't letting it land. So I thought maybe something as important as this, I'll give you a little tool to be able to remember it. Because all you'll need to do is open up a chumash and look through Rashi by Rashi on our parasha, and you'll learn and you'll remember everything that we spoke about tonight, hopefully. So let's begin. Rashi says, Aaron was commanded to light the menorah. Why did we bring the, the parasha of the menorah? Why did we put it next to Parashat Nesi'im, the parasha discussing the heads of the tribes that bought their gift. Levi, shekishira'a Aharon, when Aharon saw Chanukat Nesi'im, he saw what they did, what they had brought. Chalsha as da'ato. He felt terrible. He was broken hearted. Why? Shelo ayayim ahem, b'chanukah lo hu, lo shivato, lo shivto. Not him and not his tribe were involved in the bringing of such a gift. So Aaron felt left out. God said to him, I swear to you, what you have is going to be bigger than what they have. Because you're going to light and you're going to prepare the candles. Sounds nice. I see you're shaking, Mama. Beautiful. Okay. You can light the candles. What does that mean? You're going to light the candles. What does that mean? Ramban actually is very bothered by this whole Rashi. Now, to be fair to Rashi, it's not coming from Rashi. It's a Midrash Tan Chuma. He's almost quoting it verbatim. But Rashi, in not explaining what it means, leads you to believe that the pacifier the booby prize for not being involved, not him and not his shevet, was what? Was the fact that he got to light the candles of the menorah. Ramban says, I don't understand. That's what you went with? That's what you went with? How many other korbanot does Aharon bring? How many other things does he do? Not only that, he even does something which nobody could do, not the Shivatim, not the Nisi'im, and that's going to the Kodesh HaKodeshim on Yom Kippur. Why does God not say, right after this, you feel bad? Let's talk about the Ketoret on Yom Kippur. Only you, Aharon, only once a year, Kodesh HaKodeshim, what a date with destiny. Because of this, Ramban says that the simple Pshat in, in the Midrash is not referring to to the lighting of the menorah at all. It's referring to, and I'll read you the words of Ramban. Aval, what's it talking about? It's coming to teach you. Al Chanukah shel Nerot Shaita bebayit Sheni al Yide Aron Ubarav. God told him, I promise you, you're going to get something bigger and better than what they got. And what was he talking about? None of the korbanot that Aharon had brought. Ritzoni Lomar, what am I talking about? Ramban says, Chashmonai Kohen Gadol Ubanav. 
You're going to get something. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the miracle of Hanukkah. That's what you're going to get. That's much bigger than anything that they achieved. You have that. My friends, in trying to understand Ramban, in trying to understand Rashi, I think we have our first lesson, our first elements of recognition as to one of the most important things that we have in the art of Chinuch. And that is, ultimately, Rashi and Ramban perhaps are not arguing at all. How could such a thing be? What is it? Is he talking about the menorah or is he talking about Hanukkah? I want to say that those two things are the same thing. You see, exactly what Aharon does is what merits to be able to have the Chashmonai Ubanam. Now most time we think, when we think about rewards in the Torah, what do we think about? You did a mitzvah, okay, God says, here's a reward. I did this, I'm paying it out. You went here, here's a car, here's a house, here's a thing, and it's a tit for tat trade. One has nothing to do with, one, with the other. But in Judaism, punishment, reward, is never disconnected from the source of punishment or reward. It's always a mirroring factor of it. When we say that a person is punished and rewarded, midah keneged midah, it's not just a way that God rewards or punishes. It's the very essence of the reward and the punishment. So therefore, this thing that you did right, you achieved, you merited something like that in your life. My friends, you know what got Aharon this gift? The fact that Aharon had all the spirituality in the world. The fact that Aharon had the Kodesh Kodashim. The fact that Aharon had all the sacrifices. The fact that Aaron was killing it. And not one of those Nisiim, not one of them could match what he had. And yet, what did Aaron feel when he saw the, the Nisiim have an element of spirituality? Chalshaz dato. Ramban's question perhaps is backwards. Ramban wants to know, how come we didn't list all those other things? Your answer, Ramban, is the answer to your own question on Rashi. What God wanted to see was, who is Aaron? You have a person who sits and learns Gemara every day. You see, I have a person who does Chesed every day. He keeps Shabbat, keeps kosher. He can feel great about himself. Then you see this Baal Teshuvah, been religious for one and a half minutes exactly. But they're so careful with Lashon Hara. How do most religious people look at someone who's newly religious? Let's sort of, what do they say? Baal Teshuva, it'll wear off. What do they say? I'm a much bit, yeah, he might have this one thing, but look at what I have. Aharon did the most important thing you could do in Chinuch. He publicly displayed Chalishut Adat. There was a gift to God. There was a chance to give tzedakah. There was a chance to build a mikveh. There was a chance to inaugurate a Bet Knesset, to help build a school. And I was not part of it. Ah! He was tearing his hair out. My friends, you know what gave him grandchildren that were Hashmonaim? Was that Aaron HaKohen's children watched him get depressed over the fact that he could not have more kedusha. He didn't think of himself as top of the world. No one could touch this. The opposite. He saw something beautiful in somebody else. And he recognized it. And he appreciated it. And he valued it. And he was jealous of it. And he wanted to incorporate it. That was passed down to his sons. And from his sons to his sons' sons. And all the way down to Hashmonaim. There's a beautiful moment. The moment that I believe is the miracle of Hanukkah. Everyone thinks the miracle of Hanukkah is that the oil burned eight days. I think they're missing the point. The greatest miracle of Hanukkah is not the oil burning. It's not even the wars being won. 
You know what the greatest miracle of Hanukkah is? When Matityahu Kohen Gadol is sitting there on the Mizbeach, and the guy brings a pig into the Bet, into the Bet HaMikdash, and there's idols in the Bet HaMikdash already, and he says, here, take this pig, slaughter it on the Mizbeach. Matityahu reaches into his robe, he pulls out the knife, the guy thinks he's going to bring the Korban. He jumps off the Mizbeach, stabs him in the heart, screams out, Mi kamocha ba'elim amunai, who is like you amongst the mighty, Mi l'ashem elai, who's with me? And who comes with him? Him and his five kids. That's the big army. Ladies and gentlemen, that moment was a moment that was created, it was a miracle that someone could make that move without a plan, without knowing what would be, how it would turn out, who was going to sign up. You know, they didn't take the temperature, like just send out some messages to the people, like anyone interested in a, maybe if we arrange a, who would want to come if we, you know, do you guys think we should charge? How about, do we need food? There was no questions. They were in a state of tumah. They were in a state of despair. But this man had learned from his great-grandfather that if there's a chance to stop one thing or a chance to get one thing that's worth sacrificing and jumping for. The first lesson of Chinuch is, actually, stop translating Chinuch as teach. Because when you're trying to teach your children, but you stand for the opposite of what you say, you talk all the time about Lashon Ara, but unfortunately, you're all the rest of the time Talking Lashon Ara. You teach all the time about how important Chesed is. But when a chance comes to do Chesed, you're rolling your eyes. What do you think your kids are going to hear? What do you think your kids are going to learn? What you said or what you did in the way you did it? The first lesson, therefore, of Chinuch is... God says to Aaron HaKohen, what did they do? They had Chanukah Tanesi'im. Aaron, I want you to know that your Chanukah, the one that you're going to have later on, it's going to be an entirely different thing. They did something, it happened one time. What you did is going to be so powerful that your great, 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 great grandchildren are still going to have what you did just now in their bones. You know, a lot of times we think to ourselves that when we show our children something, it has to be an action. We have to do this. We have to buy that. We have to study this. But what did the children of Aharon here learn? They learned from Aaron exhibiting a feeling. When they see when your children see, what makes you upset? When they see, if you came to the shiur and it started already, and you're like, oh, you didn't do anything. You didn't say anything. But they picked up on the fact that the Torah is so precious to you. The first lesson of Chinuch is, stop teaching. Stop teaching. I don't know what's happening here. But this is running away on its own. It has a life of its own. <laughs> okay. Hopefully that will work. My friends, it turns out then that what Ramban and Rashi are teaching is the same thing. Aaron, you were rewarded with lighting the candles, but I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about something much more profound. Our rabbis tell us that everything in the Mishkan had a specific purpose. And its purpose wasn't only to fill, fulfill its function in the Beit HaKnesset, in the Beit HaMikdash. It was something that would last forever. V'chen ta'asu, says the Gemara, l'dorot. What was the menorah? The menorah was the or, the light of the Jewish people. And my friends, what is the light of the Jewish people if not for our children? 
So let's try and understand. When we talk about emulating, when we talk about showing this dugma, the way we behave, the way we feel, the way we allow our children to feel. Today's children, many of them, are very stunted emotionally. You know why? Part of the reason is because they did not learn from their parents that it was okay to cry. They did not learn from their parents that it was okay to actually accept, to feel, and to understand what failure looks like and how it's okay to be upset about something. So what did they do instead of being upset or being sad? They just changed the reality. It's not my fault. It's not my fault that this is what... It's your fault. If kids were allowed to feel chalisha as da'atam, what a gift you'd be giving to your children to model what it looks like. Oh, I'm not a success always. I don't blame others always. Could you imagine if we would have been Aaron Akohen? You know what would have happened? We would have felt bad. And then we would have called everyone on the block and said, I can't believe they left me out of the thing. Me! How dare they? Don't they know who I am? I should have been the one. That's what we would do. Our chalsha as da'atam would be turned into a complaint. It would be turned into a machloket. Aaron doesn't blame anyone. He just says, I wish, I wish I could have been involved. And that makes such an impression on his children. My friends, that is our first concept. Let's move now to the second idea, the second Rashi on the parasha. Rashi says, Baha'alotecha. You want to be able to raise children. Al Shem, why do we use the word Baha'alotecha, which means to raise up? Technically, what is he doing? He's lighting. We should have said, when you light the candles. How do you say to light candles? Women should know this. You say it every Shabbat. Ladlik. It should have said, Bahadlikecha. Why did it say Baha'alotecha? She gives us two answers to this question. One answer I dealt with in Breakfast in the Class. I don't know if you guys heard this one. The one about raising children up, being there, but then stopping to be there to give them the chance to be able to do things themselves. I'm not going to repeat what I said in the class if anyone heard it before. But my friends, Rashi gives us two reasons. One is you hold the candle there until the candle rises by itself. The second answer is, Our rabbis have taught us, Mikan... There were steps in front of the menorah. That the Kohen stands on those stairs and he lights the menorah. My friends, these two ideas. Idea number one, that you light the candle, hold it until the flame rises up by itself. And the second, that there are stairs in front of the menorah are teaching us a profound lesson in Chinuch. The first, let's do with the first answer, the first pshat in Rashi. And let's feel what he's telling us. Rashi says, you need to hold the candle there until the candle is able to rise by itself. I have a question though. And here's my question. It's funny, because those of you paying attention in the Torah previously, you'll remember that actually we had a whole sentence in the Torah talking about stairs in front of something. The Pasuk says, That you could not have stairs going up to the Mizbeach, you had to have a ramp. So how come when it comes to the Mizbeach, you have to have a ramp? And when it comes to the Menorah, we have no problem with stairs. Right? The Pasuk literally says, that when you're walking upstairs, a person lifts his robe, maybe it's a little bit inappropriate, you could see underneath his robe. Okay? That's literally. Al Chachamim, though, therefore, tell us on this Pasuk that when you step up the stairs, it's not only that you're lifting up your robe, because actually, the Kohanim were wearing shorts underneath their robe. So it wasn't like there was anything inappropriate about it. The Chachamim tell us that the idea is if you want to come to the Mizbeach, you have to be able to walk in a way where there's not pre-proscribed stairs. Where you could take the steps that you need to take at your level and at your pace. But if that's the case, why in the world 
Would it not be like that when it comes to the menorah? Again, let's review. Sometimes you have somebody, a parent, a rabbi, a mentor, they're telling the guy, listen, you know you need to keep Shabbat, like, from now. You know you need to put on a kippah. You know you need to put on a pair of seat. I remember once we had a trip. This guy came down. After one day on this Kiru trip, the guy came down wearing a kippah. Guy had no Judaism in his life before. Came downstairs wearing a kippah. I said, Daniel, comes over. I said, give me the kippah. He says, why? I said, you're not ready for the kippah. Give me the kippah. As a rabbi, sometimes you need to make sure that the guy is actually acting in a way where they're capable of acting, capable of maintaining. And if he's not ready for that, that added step or added speed is not going to help. It's going to harm so if that's the reason why you can't have steps when it comes to the Mizbeach, why do you got stairs over here when it comes to the Menorah? Is that a good question? The answer is, huh? You were like, yes. Oh, okay, good. I was, no, he's like, no. It's a bag. Okay. The answer is remarkable. When it comes to the Mizbeach, we're talking about sacrifices. When it comes to sacrificing, you need to take it very slow. You need to be prepared before you're ready to give up something. I'll never forget, another boy from that same trip slowly started learning, slowly started growing, slowly started keeping Shabbat. Two years later, I'm sitting down with him at a Shabbaton. He says, can I speak to you for a minute? I said, sure. He says, Rabbi, you know, I'm doing everything. I'm doing Shabbat, I'm doing this, I'm getting my whole apartment, it's kosher, I'm doing this. He goes, the last thing is I haven't put on a kippah because I feel like the minute I put a kippah on my head, all my friends know I'm toasted. You know? Nefechti liot dos. Like, you understand? MS dos. That's what happened. I'm now, you know, completely toasted. I'm, I'm done. Now, what's going to be? Every, everything else is in the privacy of my own house. What should I do, he said to me. I said, you're growing? He said, yes. I said, you're keeping Shabbat? He said, yes. I said, you're keeping kosher? He said, yes. I said, you're learning Torah? He said, yes. I said, whenever you're ready, it will come. You're not ready, you're not ready. When you're ready, you're ready. Yarmulke is not in the Torah. Shabbat, kosher, tamu Torah, all those other things you talk about, those are in the Torah. You're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. Whenever you're ready, don't rush. I turned around. I started walking away. And he goes, Rabbi, I think I'm ready. (laughs) When it comes to sacrificing, pushing someone to go where they're not ready, always fails. But the menorah is not about sacrifice. The menorah is about shine. The menorah is about expression. It's about lighting up the world. Like we sing, we think about, we pray when we light the candles on Shabbat. We pray that our children should shine. There is a condition for children to shine. In order for a child, in order for a person, in any age, by the way, you think that you're only raising your kids when they're eight? No. You never stop raising them. Even when they have kids, you're still raising them. Now you're teaching them how to bring up kids. And when they get married off their kids, then you're teaching them how to deal with the in-laws and how to have, bring people into the house. You're always teaching. Chinuch never ends. You're teaching, you're helping them, like we said, with every new beginning. You're helping them with every inauguration every inaugural thing, everything they've not yet done, you become mom and dad, Abba ve'ima, safta ve'safta, odapam ve'odapam ve'odapam. For someone to shine, what do they need? They need to feel like they have a ma'ala. That they're great. That they're strong. That they're capable To shine, you don't need criticism. To shine, you need to feel ma'ala. And therefore, in front of the menorah, we have a ma'ala. 
We have stairs. Ma'alot. I'll never forget. I was asked to come give a talk in Mexico City. I love this. One of my highlights of my life. I'll tell you why. I'm there, ready to starting to teach. All of a sudden, the door opens. Somebody walks in from the back. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Walks all the way to the front. He sits down, right in, like right there. Who was it? Rabbi Pesach Krohn. Now you have to understand. Now, you have speakers. Every Monday and Thursday, there's another speaker. Tonight, I'm here. There's going to be somebody else. Last week. When I was growing up, there were no speakers. You guys remember? He was the only one. <laughs> there wasn't like 40 other people that you could go. If you went to a convention, it was him 12 times. Like, you know, <laughs> that's... I read his books. Like, from the time I was a little kid, I could hear... And I could even now, even now, I could hear him in my mind, like, like doing his thing. He's so abus. He's the sweetest, <laughs> nicest... He's so amazing. But he's sitting there. He's listening to my whole shoot. I'm like, what is happening? It was weird. I was weirded out a little bit. All right. After the thing, he comes up to me. And he says, wow, Reb Schleimer. You know, you know. (laughs) (laughs) You're this, and the way you spoke, and you're a star. And he's going on and on. I was like, holy cow. I didn't know what to do. My head was going to explode. He says, someone as good as you, as special as you, as chachim as you, really should not be drinking out of a bottle. Someone had put a bottle of water on the stender, on the thing. I'm drinking out of the bottle of water. Anyway, I said, uh, you know, normally someone criticizes you. What do you say? Well, you know, but here I was like, absolutely, I am that big. <laughs> so, so, I'm so special. He buttered me up for an hour only in order to tell me. <laughs> Pour it into the cup because someone is as shuv as you. When it comes to the Mizbeach, ma'ala. You got it? That's why it's not a stira. There's so many times that what our children need from us. And, and we get it wrong. They come, and they need only one thing. And what do we do? Like, nine times out of ten, we step in the trap. Yeah, you know, if you would have done it this way, you wouldn't have this threat. No! They're upset. They feel bad. They didn't do well. And what do you do? You rub salt in the wound. That was your chance to build them a ma'ala, a step, to make them feel. One of the most powerful elements of chinuch is not actually about the thing that you want them to do. I need to make my kids learn responsibility. I need to make my kids be honest. I need to make my kids be kind. I need to make my kids be this, be this, be this, do 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 this. And we think that's the job. Really, the job is not... I need to make them do this. I need to make them do that. Really, the job is I need to make them feel like they can do this, 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 this. Once they feel like they can, they walk into everything and they own it. My friends, if you built the ma'ala, then the shalhevet is ole. Me'eleha. Are you understanding how gorgeous these words are from Rashi? Rashi gives you two pshatim. What you think? Because Rashi is like telling you this. Oh, and also he already told you another answer. Like what? Disconnected? No. Rashi is more elegant than that. It's more beautiful than that. It's more brilliant than that. Rashi is telling you. You know how you get them to be strong enough on their own to make them feel that they're strong enough on their own. How many compliments have you given your children? And people are like, <laughs> I actually do, Rabbi. I remember once someone told me, Rabbi, I compliment my children. I said, really? That's fantastic. 
He says, yeah, I remember when she graduated, I told her. I was like, when she graduated? How many years ago was that? He says, uh, 12? 12 years ago. I was like, you're patting yourself on the back because you gave her a compliment 12 years ago? <laughs> Mastering the art of chinuch. <laughs> yeah, any. <laughs> Okay. Let's move on to the next lesson from Rashi. The first lesson was how a person exemplifies everything they want their child to be able to learn. Not just in deed, but also with emotion, the way that they feel, the way that they relate to things. That's as important. The second thing that we learned tonight is about raising up the feeling, the spirit of our children in, in making them feel like there's nothing that they can't do. They're facing a particular challenge, a particular problem. What do you do? You make them feel like this is easy for them. This is something that they can do in their sleep. But I want to address one last point that I think is really important. In order for a child to feel like they are on a ma'ala, <laughs> I have a guy in my shul. Guy tells me, Rabbi, you know, I really want to have like a real a great relationship with you. Like I want to have, like I want to be like one of like your, your student, like one of your best students. Like I really want to, I was like, sure, of course. He goes, well, can we just like learn, can we like learn like a couple of hours every day? I'm like, are you joking? <laughs> right? I, I was like, I have a lot of people. I have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of whole community. I got to teach. I got to connect with. I got to. Raise up, I gotta inspire, I gotta do all the different things I gotta do. I said, and you're one of those people, and I love them, and I love you. He goes, I want you to love me more than you love them. <laughs> one of the great challenges of creating ma'ala, making someone feel elevated, is that the minute you put someone else, I want you to imagine, you go to the Olympics, you see one, two, three. You walk up there to the top, Feel great, right? Then the announcer says, we'd like to also ask uh, Mr. Jonathan to rise up and stand on the number one, and then one, and then the next one, and then the that is 14 people standing on the square. How do you feel about your number one right now? Worthless. In a certain level, the concept of ma'ala requires that feeling to be mine alone. No one else could share this. Because by definition, if I share with somebody else, it means nothing. How do you do that for your children? And what do you have to be careful of when it comes to this element of ma'ala? I want to share with you something that we read in last week's parasha. I think this is very important. The pasuk says that the nisi'im came and they brought uh, six wagons and they brought 12 bulls, 12 oxes. Okay? They brought their korban. Now what are they going to do with the wagons and the oxes? Start Uber wagons? I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> Hashem says, you know what you should do? Distribute the oxes and the wagons. <laughs> they brought it. Hashem says to Moshe, take the wagons, take the oxen, distribute them. Give the wagons and the oxen to the tribes of Levi that need them. Each one according to what they need. And Moshe, what's it called? And Hashem said to Moshe to give it out. Moshe took the wagons and he took the oxen and he gave it to the Levim, the two wagons and the four oxen. So two wagons pulled by four oxen, he gave to who? B'nei Gershon. According to what they needed. And the four agalot, and the eight oxen it took to pull that. That he gave to B'nei Merari. They got something else. They got four wagons and eight. The other one got two wagons and, and four. They got uh, four, four wagons and eight. The sons of Kehat, they didn't get anything. For them, they did all their work by their shoulder. What are we talking about? There are three tribes in the tribe of Levi. Gershon, Kehat, Merari. 
Gershon, their job was to carry things from the Mishkan, but things that were lighter, okay? The Kilaim, the, 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 the Masach, all things from the Mishkan, but they, they were lighter objects. So what did they need? They needed some wagons, and they needed a couple, they needed four oxen and two wagons. The other guys, the people, B'nai Merari, they took the heavy panels, they took the heavy, you know, all those things they needed to put on those very heavy weight, they needed more wagons, they got more wagons. Comes B'nai Kehat, what does B'nai Kehat get? Nothing, why? Because the B'nai Kehat, they carried things like the Aron, that you took it on the poles, you put it on your shoulder, and it was only carried by humans. It was only carried on a human shoulder. You didn't need an ox. You didn't need a wagon because you're not carrying anything on a wagon or on an ox. Fair enough? Rashi, all the commentators, they're all explaining one after the next, after the next, what this means. Why is it going into each one? Why back, forth? I want to share with you a beautiful lesson, my friends. One of the challenges of children feeling like they are on a ma'ala. You know what the challenge is? The challenge is that the child feels... Like there's someone else on the number one thing here. And not only that, not only am I not special, as they're standing here on the number one, they're like pushing me off. I'm not as important as they are. You gave them more than you gave me. Moshe Rabbeinu says, listen, I know I'm going to give two wagons, four oxen. I'm going to give it to them. I'm going to give these guys four wagons, eight oxen. You know what? They have heavier. And these kahats going to get nothing. Kahat, but understand. You know why I'm giving you nothing? Because you don't need this. One of the greatest challenges in children feeling special, children feeling loved, and children feeling appreciated is when they feel that things are not fair. They got. I didn't get. It's not fair. How come? You love them more. You like them more. What's going on? The Torah goes to great pains to explain that the whole point over here was that everybody got exactly what they needed. And the kehat that was able to carry all of this baggage on their shoulders, you know what? You, you're getting nothing. You know why? Because you need nothing. And it turns out that I didn't treat the children differently. I didn't give different things to different kids. I gave everyone the same. I gave everyone exactly what they need for their job. My friends... That is ma'ala. That allows a person, a child, to feel, even though, because kids always feel like they got shafted, short end of the stick. Ma'ala comes when everybody understands that they got exactly what they needed for their success. But you best be careful that they understand why it's fair. If that's the case, my friends, then I want to share something with you. There are times when our kids get very upset, not even because of something that we've done, but because of what life has done. What has happened to them? This happened to me. How come I am not getting the shidduch and my sister found someone right away? And immediately they translate that as to be something to do with their worth or value as a human being. And they lose ma'ala. And when you lose ma'ala, you become paralyzed. You can't do anything. Because you become obsessed with it. It becomes the definition of who you are and your character. I want to share with you one example of this. There was a fellow, came, he lived in B'nai Brak, very religious neighborhood, grew up with him, went to all the yeshivot, and one day he decided, hajeh, throwing it all away. I'm finished, chalas, done. He goes, he says to his father, I'm leaving the house. I don't want to live here. I don't want to be here with all your rules and everything. I'm out. I'm going to go live with my non-religious cousin, cousin you know, in Tel Aviv. The father can't tell him what to do. Kid wants to go to Tel Aviv. Ya Habibi Tel Aviv. He goes to Habibi Tel Aviv. Anyway, he moves in with his cousin. His cousin is not religious. The kid feels free, do whatever he wants, eat whatever he wants, keep whatever he wants. feels amazing. One day he comes home and he tells his, his cousin, he says, you know, I met this amazing girl. Really? Oh, what's her name? And he picks, what's the least Jewish name you could think of? Maria. Sorry? Maria. Maria. <laughs> Actually, in the Syrian community, we have some Marys, by the way. Which is quite odd, but we do. We've got them. Christina. Christina, there we go. Christina. 
I remember once I said Svetlana and I got in trouble because I met a Svetlana that was frumer than me, by the way. I changed the name to Svetlanya. Anyway, he says, really? Christina, Mary, Svetlana, you going out with? <laughs> Doesn't sound Jewish. He says, she's not Jewish. He says, really? I can't believe it. You're going to throw it all away? The guy's like, what? I thought I moved here to leave Benebrak to be here with my normal, free, uh, understanding, non-judgmental cousin. You're telling me now that... The guy says, listen, you know, I don't do this, I don't do that, but for my kids not to be Jewish... <laughs> That's not a thing. That's not, you know, I'm not cutting off three and a half thousand years of history. Guy says, well, I don't believe in it. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. Guy says, cousin says to him, listen. Now he's telling his non-religious cousin, he's like outdoing him on it. Anyway. The cousin says, listen, you don't believe in religion, fine. But you know what it means to be a mensch? You know what's a chazafrek? You understand? <laughs> you know what it means to be a mensch? Your parents raised you. You don't like how they raised you, fine. You don't want to live in the house, fine. But at the very least, you got to tell them that you're planning on marrying this girl. The guy says, okay, I'll do it, no problem. I'm going to tell them, and they can't stop me, and I get it, it's going to be great. I have lobster at the wedding. <laughs> Married by a priest. Okay. He calls his father. He says, Dad, I'd like to come back for Shabbat. The father's going crazy. He's dancing. He, you know, he hasn't come to Shabbat in two years. He's so excited. Little does he know. Okay. He says, I'm going to come for Shabbat. I want condition. I don't want you to say one word. Don't tell me this. I should have done that. I should wear this. Put my keep on. Where's my this? Where's my... That? Just, I want to just be me. I don't want a word from anyone in the family. Father says, okay, no problem. We'd love to have you. Kid comes home. Kobe comes back uh, to, uh, to B'nai Brak. Friday night, beautiful. They have a meal. They finish the meal. Of course, it's not a real meal. It's not a Friday night meal in Israel unless the entire table is covered with garinim seeds. <laughs> they finish the garinim. They have some laughs. It's going pretty good. Shabbat morning, they all get up. They go to shul. He's out on the porch walking back and forth, talking on his phone, shouting, yelling, watching a movie, playing his music. People looking up at him. He don't care. He's lo he loving it. And he decides, you know what? Right as Shabbat's over, I'm going to tell him the news. Baruch HaMavdi Dekodesh Lecho. Ya Aini. Ben Yisrael. La'amim. Okay. Everything's going according to plan. They have lunch. After lunch, father says to him, listen, you know, I'm going to a shiur. I always go to a shiur Shabbat afternoon. If you'd like to come with me, you're more than welcome. It's a shiur uh, in Gemara. The guy, you know, he could not have looked less interested if he tried. If he bought a mask that was called the not interested mask, it would have looked more interested than he did. The father says, it's from Rav Steinman. Big gadol ador in B'nai Brak. What does he say? He says, Rav Steinman, okay, I'll come. Says, what? He comes to the shul, an hour and a half. You know, you shalom idat, back, forth, igule uh, devela, you know, this, that, mashmesh bekiso, chot, shayin, on and on, the rashid, the tosafot. The guy's sitting there like this, the whole shul. End of the shul. Everyone gets up to say Shabbat Shalom. Someone runs up to the rabbi, like usually happens. They're in a religious shul. I'll always be that one guy. Runs up to the rabbi. This guy is not religious. Say something nice, like, you know, get him back. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe you could say something, rabbi. <laughs> what are you going to say? Abracadabra? Okay. <laughs> rabbi comes to the rabbi. The rabbi says to him, Ah, oh, nice to meet you. What's your name? He says, uh, So I see you're back. You're, you know, this is not your normal uh, relate. You're not in your normal neighborhood. He says, no. He says, well, how long ago did you leave all of this behind? He says, two years ago. He says, oh, two years? Okay. He says, tell me, in the last two years, did you ever think, you know what? I miss it. I want to do Teshuvah. I want to come back. Did you ever think that? 
Guy says, yes, Rabbi, actually I did. He says, uh, four times. You know exactly how many times? Four times? He said, yes. Two years ago, when I left, Erev Rosh Shana, ten minutes. I got over it. Erev Yom Kippur, ten minutes. Then I went back to Basar Lavan. Fadal. The next year, same thing. Ten minutes, ten minutes. Anyway, everyone on the line is getting very uncomfortable. He's talking like this to the Gadol Ador. And if Steinman looks at him and he says, wow. You mean to tell me that you have 40 minutes of teshuvah, of hirhure teshuvah, about which the Gemara says that in a place where someone like that stands, the greatest tzaddikim can't stand? Wow, I'm so jealous of your 40 minutes. The guy does shaking. I don't know what to say. He was not expecting that. Anyway, the rabbi doesn't invite him for Shabbat. He doesn't tell him to stay by. doesn't tell him to pray our beat. He says, Shabbat Shalom. Anyway, the guy walks out. He's so shaken up. He gets home. He doesn't know. He's so, he forgets to even mention that he's getting married to this girl. He goes home. He goes home. He's sitting there talking to this, to this uh, non-Jewish girlfriend. I met the rabbi, and the rabbi said this 40 minutes. And I couldn't believe what he said. She has no idea what he was talking about. Anyway, she starts fighting. She's like, well, you, you regretted this lifestyle? You mean to tell me that at least four times in the last two years you thought about going back, you know, to, to the way it used to be? Maybe, I don't know, maybe I don't want to be with you. Anyway, back, forth, they start fighting. The whole thing gets called off slowly, but truly the guy becomes completely back on the path of Torah and Mitzvot. One day, his rabbi sees him learning. I don't know what he's doing. Something religious. And he says to him, Tell me, there's one thing I don't understand. One thing. Why in the world did you agree to go to that shiur in the first place? What happened afterwards, I know the story. But why in the world would you go? And the boy smiles. He says, you know, it's funny you asked that question. When I was in fourth grade, I went to school. And in this religious school, they decided to have one of the great Roshe Yeshiva come and test us on the Gemara that we learned. Before he came, we're only in fourth grade, they told the rabbi, Rabbi, relax, take it easy, you know, they're fourth graders. Ask some easy, easy questions, you know. Rabbi came in, he asked everyone easy questions. Everyone got this answer, that one answer, this one answer, that one answer. Came to me, he asked me the easy question, I couldn't answer it. Instead of moving on, I said, I'm sorry, Rabbi, I'm sorry. He said, don't worry, don't worry. He asked me another question. Even easier. I still couldn't answer it. He finally asked me a third question. It was so easy. I don't know, which way do you hold the Gemara? I don't know what he asked him. I knew the answer. The rabbi said, thank you, Baruch. Very well, moved on. At the end of the class, the rabbi said, anyone who answered the question, come to the front. I want to give them a beracha and a candy. Everyone went up at the end of the class, and they got the beracha and they got the candy. But I, I, sitting in the back, I felt like a dib. I answered the question wrong three times. He had to lower the bar, lower the bar, lower the bar till the bar was on the floor. I stepped over it. <laughs> so I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get up. And Steinman saw me in the back. And he called me forward. And he said to me, why didn't you come to get a candy? And I answered embarrassed. I didn't know the answer. And the rabbi stroked my cheek and he said, Rahi. He probably didn't say that. I don't know what the Yiddish word for Rahi is. <laughs> Although, I have to say, I was on a Pesach program recently and this Ashkenaz guy came up to me and he says, we were trying to figure out the whole first half of the trip why you kept calling my wife Rahi <laughs> in the middle of your classes. I was like, did you not entertain that maybe I wasn't randomly saying your wife's name? Rabbi calls him up, Rohi, strokes his cheek, and he says, in Judaism, we don't reward the result. We reward the effort. Everybody else tried to answer one question. They got a candy. But you try to answer three questions. You don't deserve one candy. You're right. You deserve three. And he gave me three candies. 
and he, he stroked my cheek, and he gave me a beracha. I never forgot that. So when I found out that the person giving the shiur was Rav Steinman, how could I not go? My friends, one of the most important things for our children to learn from us is that when Moshe Rabbeinu divides these wagons and bulls, he gives the ones with the heaviest load the most support and the most uh, tmicha and the most help because they're the ones that need it the most. Then the ones that needed it less, what did they get? They got half the wagons. But then there were some that were capable in this life of managing their weight and their baggage and their challenges. al Katef, Come on! Right here! Put it on! What do they get? They get nothing! Not because they're God. Not because life doesn't want to give them something. Because life is giving them the greatest gift ever. The gift of being able to be strong enough to lift something yourself. Yeah, any. If you could communicate this to your kids, Hakadosh Baruch Hu knew that this young boy was going to need support, and there was going to be one person in the world that was going to be able to give him that support in that moment right before his wedding. And who was it going to be? It was going to be Rev Steinman. For some people, the only support they ever need is for someone to say to them. You didn't fail. You tried three times as hard. Yeah, any. And when that man shows up and gives a Gemara class, the guy's going. What class would you have thought would have got this guy out of bed? Top ten reasons why Judaism is wrong. That's what he would have went to. How to prove that there is no God. That's what he would have went to. You think he's going to come to Menachas, Davtzadi, Zion? What are you talking about? You know what the answer is? The famous line that goes, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And when they know how much you care, they don't care how much you know. Maya Angelou got it wrong. Her expression was, that they don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. I would actually wager that once they know how much you care, they don't care how much you know. Because it ain't ever about that. There's a famous line attributed to Dr. Spock. He said that love is the most powerful force in the universe. And it is the ultimate answer to every question and problem. So if we want to know how to master the art of chinuch, and we are fully cognizant of how impossible that is, because every kid needs something else. I love when people come and they say, listen, this is what you need to do. Immediately you should know that that guy does not know what he's talking about. Because every child is different. Right? You have these people telling you that you should never put any boundaries with your children. Wrong. You have a guy telling you that you should always put boundaries with your children. Wrong. If he uses the word always, he's already wrong. Always. No, joking. (laughs) But what if you don't need the answer to the problem? What if it doesn't matter what the shiur and what you're teaching them? Because love is that answer. Ma'ala is that answer. My friends... I want to add one last piece because we're running out of time and I wish I could talk to you for another two hours. The last thing I want to share with you tonight, one of the important tools, is resilience. When Aaron saw that he couldn't be part, he was broken. He was sad. But what came from Aharon being broken? Something beautiful. 
One of the great challenges in life is that we automatically assume always that bad things are bad. That hard things are bad. That difficult things, that sad things, that painful things are bad. Chanukah does not come unless Aaron, unless his heart is broken. That better shiduch doesn't come unless your heart is broken by losing the first one. That job and that business that you thought was going to take you to your old age, but actually was going to run into the ground slowly and painfully. And what did God do? Instead, He tore the band-aid off. And very quickly it disappeared. And God was doing a chesed with you. But if you don't stay in the ring long enough to give it a chance, you never see it. You walk away and you have this thing labeled in your past. Sadness. Failure. Problems. And you never open the box again. And you never revisit those terrible times in your life to see how beautiful They actually were in the fullness of time. What if we could take a walk down into our past and find those difficult things and ask ourselves, what did they happen for? The famous idea goes, Why should the non-Jews say, right? The Pasuk says, many different versions of it, where is their God? But the Chachmeh Musa say, it does not only mean that, it means, Lama yomru agoyim. You know who asks why things happen? Not us. Nations of the world. We don't ask lama. We ask lima. For what? To what end? For what purpose? For what biracha? And in that opportunity, we get a chance to rewrite all the difficult parts of our past and create not only a beautiful narrative for the future, but an ability to release that weight from our shoulders that we've been carrying for so many years. You dignified that pain with purpose, with pleasure even. But only if you go back to visit it again and see where it went. My friends, one of the greatest things to teach our children is not to be afraid of failure and not to survive failure and not to think that inevitably they will fail, but to teach them to fail lechatechila, to fail up, to engage in things that everybody else says is impossible, and to not be worried that they'll fail, and to embrace that and recognize that from that, and specifically from that, is going to be shelcha gedola mishelahem. You know what they all did? All the Nisim, they gave the same gift as everybody else. And that's beautiful. Very nice. It's safe. Reward comes to those who risk, to those who are willing to put themselves out there. And when a person is willing to do that, unafraid of failing, having failing being your best friend, being willing to walk up to 10 people and ask them if they want to come for a Shabbat to your house and having them turn you down. And that not being something that bothers you. My value, my worth, it's inherent. It's from me. When a person feels that way, then they could do anything. The last piece of our puzzle tonight is the last piece that we learn in the Pasuk. This menorah, it was made, banged out of gold. One giant piece of gold hammered out. Why did God make Moshe's life difficult? Why wouldn't he let him carve the branches? It's so intricate. Let him have one of those sculpting tools. Let him sit there. No, you got to bang. What happens when you bang gold? You push it over here, it goes over there. You push it over here, it goes over there. It's very difficult. My friends... Why did God want Moshe to do that? You know what the answer is? You know what the difference is between when you bang out gold and when you cut it? When you cut gold out, there's a piece of your slab that you're not using. But when you bang on it, every part, there's no good parts, medium parts, bad parts. It's all one part. It's a mikshah achat. 
People love to remember the great moments in their life, and some of us have quite a few. But what if we looked at it so differently? What if we understood that that's what made us great? Those things that were difficult, when we felt banged up, when we didn't know how we were going to do it. My favorite Khatam Sofer, he says something unbelievable. There are three things that Moshe Rabbeinu does not understand from God. Anyone know what they are? One we just mentioned, Moshe Rabbeinu, when it comes time to create the menorah, he doesn't know how to do it. Nitkasha Moshe. Moshe didn't know how to do it. He didn't know how to make the menorah. You know what else he needed help from HaKadosh Baruch Hu for? In Egypt, in, when they were leaving Egypt, how to sanctify the new moon. What does God say? HaChodesh Hazel Lachem. This moon, like this. Kazeh Ra'e V'Kadesh. Like this you should see. V'zeh Ma'aseh menorah. Look, this is how you build the menorah. So, menorah, HaChodesh, and the Shekel. Says the Khatam Sofer, we all know that Hashem showed him a shekel out of fire. This is what they should give. Zeyitinu, kol ha'over ha'pikudim. Says the Khatam Sofer, those three things, menorah, shekel, and ha'chodesh, spell the name Moshe. Because if you want to know what made Moshe great, it was the things that he could not do. It was the things that he was nitkashe on. But when he didn't stop for being Nitkasheh, when he wasn't afraid of Nitkasheh, that's what made Moshe Moshe. So here we are trying to avoid all the difficult parts of our lives. And that's what our kids are doing too, because they see how much we care about comfort and pleasure and relaxing and vacation. I remember once my wife, we were joking about how lazy people have become in our world. Any of you remember back in the day when you used to have contact lenses, the old, old ones? You had a machine, and it opened up like this, like it was a spaceship. You put the things on either side. You remember that? You're not old enough, you're laughing. You have no idea. You don't know what a tape is or why it's related to a pencil. Get out of here, okay? <laughs> and in this little thing where you put the thing, you had one, you had to put, the first one was uh, saline solution, then you had to have another thing that would, uh, what's it called, that would uh, uh, decontaminate de it. I don't know what the word, word is exactly. But there was three different solutions. Then they had three-in-one solution. You have to put the three-in-one. Okay, amazing. Only one bottle. <laughs> Good for me. Lazy guy. Excellent. Now, what did you do? Put the three things? What do you have to do? No, no, you don't even need that. Yeah, just spray it on it. And go like this. Rub on it. Good. Then my wife saw the first time. She said, look, look at how lazy we've become. The bottle said, three-in-one solution. No rub. <laughs> that means that they... Scientists sat down and they said, how can we save people from doing this? <laughs> I was thinking to myself, I wonder what would happen if we took teenagers' phones away from them and just spayed three on one, no rub, and if they stopped doing this on their phones. I wonder if that would work on their phones. Either way, right, no rub? That's what you got to save me from? We're so desperate not to do any work. Not to have any discomfort. Everything needs to be immediate. Your Uber, right here. You need a drive, no problem. Your food, they're going to send it to you. No, delivery is not good enough. Instacart, it's got to be there in 15 minutes. They used to send you a package, it would take six weeks to get there. Then, ooh, express delivery, five business days. Then, wow, two days. Then, prime. Prime. You know why it's called prime? In Hebrew, the way you spell prime is pe, resh, yud, mem, because we've become parim. <laughs> We're not even humans anymore. We're a bunch of animals saying, feed me, now. Put the food in my mouth, ah. <laughs> what made Moshe Moshe were the things that were most difficult for him to do. My friends, and if that's the case, then what if we taught our kids to chase difficulty? Ah, oh, so frustrating. You meet couples. They're like, Rabbi, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work out. 
I said, I understand. I get it. I know why you guys have problems. Really? Yeah, it's your voice, honey. Your voice is <laughs> so annoying. Is this such a thing as a voice transplant? I don't know. Maybe you could have like a voice donor and give you their voice. I don't know. Rabbi, it's not going to work out. It's not. It's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. Why is it not going to work out? It's like I was speaking to my therapist. And my therapist said, love shouldn't be this hard. She says, why are you not saying anything? I said, because how could I argue? with the therapist. <laughs> Is there anything harder than love? Real love? Anything in this world. Is there anything harder than loving someone so completely that even when they get you so angry, you still love them? And even when it's difficult, and even when it costs you time and energy and money, and, 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 and uh, focus, and it costs you your emotional health and your sanity, you're still there for them. That's what love is. Love shouldn't be hard. If it ain't hard, then that's not love. If you're checking out when it's hard, then you have like. You have fallen in like with somebody. Ay. <sighs> One of the most important things, my friends, is to learn not to run away from that which is difficult, but to understand that in those underdeveloped potential moments lies all of the greatness that we have. We've learned a couple of the things, a couple of things that help master the art of chinuch. But I will say this. If you do every trick right, and you follow everything I said tonight, and you learn 10 times more, because I have another maybe two hours to say to you tonight, but I don't have time, it still won't work. There's one pasuk I want you to remember, and I want you to remember it always. It's an old halabi tune. That's a joke, it's not. El hanar hazeh hit palalti. Chana says, I prayed for this child. I don't want another one. You want to give me a better one? I don't want a better one. This is mine. This is the one I prayed for. The most important thing for your child's development and success is the tears you shed and the heart you raise up to God as you pray day and night for their success. And be specific, Dachila, please. Don't be one of those parents. You know, you're praying for your son or your daughter and you're like, Torah ba ma'asim tovim. Like, no, no, that is... That's what other people wish you about your kid because they don't care about your kid. Nobody... Do, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Keep showing them pictures. They love it. They love it. <laughs> they want to see all of them. <laughs> what makes you a parent? What defines something as love? When you pray and pray and pray and pray, and ultimately, maybe God will answer and give you that son that you hoped for, that daughter that you hoped for. But maybe an even more important thing to pray for is not that your daughter or son should become what you hoped for, but that you should have a heart to feel that wherever they are, they are what you hoped for. And you, you prayed for this kid, and that you love them exactly where they are. And because you love them, you want more for them. But you don't love them less because they're not what you wanted, or they're not what you thought, or you, they're not what you dreamed. When a person prays like that, then Hashem is sure to answer the tefillot. And maybe then people will look at you and your kids and say, wow, this person truly has mastered the art of chinuch. When actually what you've mastered is the art of prayer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I want to thank Zoran Dindagmi and Zaku Baruch 
for bringing us out here tonight. I want to thank Sharon. I want to thank this Beth Knesset. I know the rabbi is not here. I got to meet a few of the people that are involved in this holy Bet Knesset over Pesach, and I could already tell it was a very special place. But it took the Aminovs and the holy Aminover to get me uh, to get me to come out to Miami. But I'm glad Baruch Hashem, all these things, all the stars aligned to be able to learn something together tonight. And our words of Torah Bezat Hashem should be a zechut, first and foremost, for all of our shivuim to be able to return home, because every one of them has a mother at home, Elanar Azet Palati, and every one of them has uh, Am Yisrael praying for them. Uh, we should be zochet Bezat Hashem to see them come home soon. But more importantly than Hashem bringing them home. Hashem, don't bring them home. Bring us home. If God brought us all back there with Mashiach, He wouldn't need to bring them home. Inshallah, we should be zochet. Amen.